good morning, depending on where you're viewing us from today, joining us from today. I'd like to welcome you to Creating Partnerships for Promoting Citizen Science and Advocacy. In today's webinar, members of the Lower Hudson Urban Waters Collaborative are going to be sharing with us how they created a partnership to strengthen stewardship and community science capacity and amplified, amplified their collective voices to inform local decision makers about environmentally sound policies. My name is Caroline Bodd, and I, along with my River Network colleagues, Renee Mazurik and Adam Griggs, are your session organizers. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Urban Waters Learning Network, the network which is funded by the US EPA and led by a partnership between River Network and Groundwork USA is a peer-to-peer -peer network of over 380 individuals and organizations working to restore and revitalize lo local waterways. Its purpose is to strengthen the effectiveness of urban water practitioners across the country by providing opportunities to share experiences, exchange technical expertise, and learn about funding and technical resources available. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. There are handouts from the presenters along with a copy of the slides available for download in the handout section of your attendees panel. All attendees will be on mute throughout the session. However, we encourage you to use the chat and question box to submit any questions for our panelists or to ask for technical assistance. At the end of the webinar, we'll get through as many questions and the queue as, we, as possible and we'll share the panelists' contact information so you can follow up with them directly for more information. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation survey, and we would be grateful if you would take the time to provide your feedback. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Renee, who's going to introduce to you today's presenters. Thanks, Caroline. Ryan Palmer is the director of Sarah Lawrence College Center for the Urban River at BZAC. A Hudson Valley native, Ryan has over a decade of experience in the nonprofit field focusing on urban watersheds and environmental justice issues, green infrastructure projects, community organizing, and urban planning. He has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Rhode Island. Jen Epstein has worked with local community partners to monitor and improve water quality in the Hudson's tributaries since 2013. A native of the Hudson Valley, Jen earned a Master in Science in Biological Sciences from Fordham University where she studied the effects of impervious surface coverage on stream ecosystems, and a Bachelor of Arts in Earth and Plan Planetary Science from the University of California at Berkeley. She was an AmeriCorps volunteer in the Lake Tahoe region and a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa. Michelle Lubke is the Bronx River Alliance Director for Environmental Stewardship. Michelle has over 10 years of experience leading adults and school groups through creeks and natural areas managing ecological monitoring programs, and teaching about environmental science and sustainability. She holds a Master of Science from the University of Georgia in Geography and Conservation Ecology and Sustainable Development, a Master of Arts from New York University in U Environmental Conservation Education, and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Wisconsin in Zoology and Environmental Studies. Maureen Cunningham is the Executive Director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Maureen has worked both domestically and abroad on community development, biodiversity conservation, and natural resource management issues. Her academic training includes a Master of Environmental Management with a focus on community-based natural resource policy and management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a Bachelor of Arts in International Studies from the American University School of International Service. Great, thanks Renee. I'm now gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Ryan. I know, Ryan, we can see your screen, but um, it says you're self-muted, and unfortunately, I can't unmute you if you're self-muted. Here I am. Got Great, me now. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right. 
Uh, thank you all for joining on behalf of all the panelists. Uh, we saw um, some of the registration list. It looked like it was a great turnout. So we really appreciate you spending this hour with us. Um, so in general, we're going to be just be talking about what we've been up to for the last few years. Um, I'm going to start off just talking about our background on the project and our partnership. We're going to get into a lot more detail about the actual community science program, uh, including the results, some results from our uh, volunteer survey. And then we're going to spend some time talking about how we took that science and put it into action. And um, throughout the whole thing, we're going to try to sprinkle in some success stories and lessons learned. Uh, if you remember one thing from the whole webinar, um, listen to my friend Barbara over here and conserve water and stay dirty. All right. So these are the four organizations you're going to hear from today. Um, just note the shorthand down here because I did put this throughout the, um, my part of the presentation. So if you hear me mention CURB, that's my organization, the Center for the Urban River at BZAC. Um, and the other organizations will introduce themselves as they come up. Uh, but in general, you can think about the um, CURB and the Bronx River Alliance being a little bit more similar. Um, we work more at the local scale. Obviously, the Bronx River Alliance focuses you know, exclusively just on the Bronx River. You know, we're not tied to one watershed, but our home um, river is the Sawmill River here in Yonkers. And we both do um, a lot of education programs, community programs, things of that nature. So very locally based. Um, conversely, Riverkeeper and the Hudson River Watershed Alliance work river-wide, um, much more regional. Very different um, strategies how they do that. Riverkeeper, as it says right there, is New York's clean water advocate. Um, they get a lot involved a lot with litigation and, and policy and things of that nature. And the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is really not an umbrella group for all the smaller watershed groups throughout the Hudson River. So at our center at CURB, we, um, so we have a three-part mission, research, education, community programs, all focused around the Hudson River and urban watersheds. Um, and when we say we're the center for the urban river, we, we both mean the kind of lower portion of the Hudson and the urban rivers we have here in, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, but also urban rivers in general, and we hope that, you know, we're only five years young still as an organization, but we hope that, you know, as we grow, a lot of our work will be, you know, useful to other people working in urban watersheds throughout the country. Um, and we're really fortunate to have a, a really nice 4,000 square foot center right in the river. This is a view of our backyard at the bottom left there with the Hudson right out front. Um, just to give you a sense, we have a restored tidal marsh. This is sort of a typical day. We have kids out and waders going sailing for fish. Um, so a lot of what we do is education-based. It's around four to 5,000 kids come through a year to our center. Um, a lot of the research and monitoring work we're talking about today is, is fairly new for the center. Um, this is just the context of where we work. This is downtown Yonkers. Um, you see the bottom left here. This is actually our property with our little center and our marsh. Um, you can see it's a very urban environment. Um, this is actually where the sawmill empties out into the Hudson. Um, there's a pretty famous project right around here. You can't really see it. There's a big daylighting project that happened in Yonkers, which I believe um, there's a webinar, or at least a story, some, uh, through the Urban Waters, Urban Waters Learning Network, you can learn about that project. I just wanted to point it out. Um, but again, very urban, very little green space in Yonkers, even though they do have over four miles of waterfront. Um, just as an example, this little patch right here, since this picture was taken, now has a 22-story uh, high-rise on it. So they're being built up everywhere. Um, then the regional context, you see here the uh, entire Hudson River watershed, um, all the way from the Adirondacks to Albany to New York City. Um, if you notice, these smaller watersheds that are highlighted have had you know, some, some watershed effort, a watershed group of some kind having activity. And again, that's sort of the, the main mission of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is to coordinate all of these groups. Um, so in our little neck of the woods down here, way at the very bottom, um, there's these four watersheds that we're going to be talking about today. Um, we have Pecanico, um, Sawmill, Bronx, which are all neighboring. And, to touch each other and then across the Hudson we have the Spark Hill. Um, so this was obviously played into our partnership. I mean just the you know we're neighbors. The geography certainly made it useful. Um, I just want to point out the other two partners who aren't on the call are sort of the local volunteer groups, the Sparkle Water, Sparkle Creek Watershed Alliance, the Kennecco River Watershed Alliance, which is so new they don't even have a logo. Um, so these are um, ones incorporated, ones not incorporated, but these are totally volunteer, no paid staff organizations. So and, you know, in some ways they're partners, in some ways they're, you know, our constituents and who we serve, uh, but very important part of, of the project. Um, so how did it come about? I mean, all partnerships really usually start on, um, you know, some, some shared need and something that makes sense from a, a resource standpoint. And we're the same. I mean, we all share similar missions. We're all river organizations. Um, obviously, you know, our strategies are very different in how we, how we do our work. Um, but there's also overlap, um, even in geography. I mentioned the Bronx River Alliance and CURB, my group. We both work in Yonkers, or, you know, we share that. And Riverkeeper and the Baltimore Alliance, you know, work regionally. 
We also have similar watersheds. You see down here, just a simple land use map. You know, this is our area. It's all urban, residential. So we have all the same issues of stormwater and CSOs and, and you know, things that I don't need to um, explain to this group because you all know. Um, and we we're all interested in this fecal bacteria monitoring program that Riverkeeper started, um, which Jen's going to talk much more about. So the real impetus came about around 2015, we finished our lab at our center. We built a whole new uh, wet lab, got all the equipment to, to do the fecal bacteria monitoring. And that really helped out, um, really in the region, there's not many of these labs around. Riverkeeper, as you're gonna see Jen explain, has a boat that they sail up and down the Hudson all summer long, taking samples of the Hudson River. Um, and for a while, they were actually having people from the shore, people monitoring tributaries, come down, drop off samples to the boat, the boat would sit there and process them. Obviously, they were at capacity. Um, so when we built this lab in 2015, it was just, it made complete sense for us to sort of serve as the hub for anybody doing this work in the lower Hudson. Um, and that obviously was done intentionally, you know, on our part here, we, we really wanted to serve that role as a hub. That worked out. Um, you know, partnerships are all just about, you know, shared resources and, and economy of scale and that sort of thing. They're also personal. And we're really lucky in that regard. Um, you know, many of us have been working together for years. Um, let's say Jen's boss there at Riverkeeper I've known for 15 years. Um, Jen and I live in the same town and like we've taken our kids trick or treating together. Uh, Maureen, you know, I serve on her board as well as the vice president. I've known, you know, worked very closely, known her for five years. So that certainly helps when you're trying to create a partnership, having that level of trust and just history. Um, they don't need that. And I will say Michelle was, was the new kid on the block, um, who I don't think had worked with any of us really prior to this project. Um, but, you know, her and I met and, and hit it off and, you know, she met the rest of the group and, you know, just worked, just clicked. Um, but I wanted to give a shout out to River Rally and also the Urban Waters Learning Network. Um, cause even though Michelle and I work in the same town, you know, it took us both being in Alabama at the River Rally and really, you know, doing a lot of sessions together and working together to really click. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that. Um, again, this is all based on trust. I will say, you know, I'm sure we all have partners that, you know, are in a capital P partnership. We work, we might work with an organization, but it's that level of trust is not there. And that's really where, you know, when you get to that second level of partnership, whatever you want to call it, is where things like urban waters grants come from, right? I mean, they're, I'm sure you all know they're not easy to get and, and, um, just us partnering together, deciding to go in together was a big deal, right? Um, and that's, that's what we're going to be talking about a lot today is that grant. Um, this was all work done last year. The big idea was to create this Lower Hudson Urban Waters Collaborative, um, just to do all of our monitoring together, all of our research together, and then combine on, on outreach. Pretty simple idea. Um, again, I, you know, it all came about me just reaching out to folks and saying, you know, do you want to do this? Um, and it can be a hard thing. I just, you know, we all know to partner up, you lose the opportunity to apply yourself. So, you know, we all kind of had to just decide we wanted to do this and and hope and it worked. Um, I was asked to share just some stuff about the finances and you can see how the grant was broken down. Again, a, a lot of the money came to us, but I just want to point out a good amount of that. We actually went over this budget, <laughs> went to the lab tech and all the shared supplies. So we, you know, we, we served as sort of the bank for the project. And um, the agreements we had in place were only, all we had was just sub-award contracts between our groups, just a, a simple scope of work. And this is what you're gonna do. This is much you're gonna get paid. A few slides, I'm going to come back to this because I do think a lesson learned was it would have helped to have some more real documentation or agreements about the partnership. And then this flow chart. So I wanted to include this. I will say right up to that, this is probably the only flow chart I've made. I'm pretty sure still to this date. I'm not a flow chart guy, um, but I did this for the grant. It wasn't required for the grant, but it's, it really was helpful for all the partners just to see our roles and responsibilities laid out on a flow chart. I think this probably took like an hour to do once I had it all done, down on paper. Um, so I definitely suggest this as a tool. I'm sure it helped with the grant as well for the grant reviewers. Uh, but you can see basically the organizations, what river we're working in, what we had done previously, um, what our unique roles were, and then actually continues on. This was all one sheet as split up. Um, but then our key goals, what are, the, what are the things we're trying to do and specifically how are we doing it and who's doing it? Um, so this, this was very useful, I'll say. It was something I'll definitely do again. I've been converted to the world of flowcharts. Um, but there were some difficulties. I definitely wanted to share some lessons learned from this because it was all new to us. Um, one area was around recognition in media. Um, you know, we had some some circumstances where you know some press went out and not everybody was included properly, um, or like we were trying to get the word out about an event and like one group 
just wasn't doing it on time and there was some, you know, just confusion about if they should do it or not. Long story short, um, I'm thinking in the future, I started doing some MOUs with other partnership organizations. So this is separate from the scope of work, but just something laid out saying like, here's, you know, how we're gonna do outreach together. Here's who's gonna be, who's gonna check in on it. Here's the look stuff for logos, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the reason being is that, you know, I could be working with a program person at one organization, but it doesn't mean their executive director knows what's going on or the communications person knows what's going on. So I feel like just getting everything out and on the table right up front um, could be very helpful. Also with outside perceptions, uh, this is one thing we did not anticipate. Really, it was a, um, the Bronx River Alliance did have some some issues getting the permits they needed, you know, permits from the county to, to do sampling. Um, and we believe just the affiliation of Riverkeeper, who could be litigious, as you mentioned, um, kind of just hindered that process a little bit, so we weren't aware of that. Um, obviously, just the time investment, too. It, you know, it takes a lot of work to, to have a partnership. Um, it's more phone calls, it's more meetings, and um, the funding is also uncertain. So this, you know, the grant, this grant has now expired. Um, we're all working, we're still doing this program this year um, through our own funding. So I have, you know, I have a grant, Michelle has a grant. We're all just sort of pooling our resources together. Uh, but obviously that makes it a little bit more difficult not to have that one nice pot of money. Um, and then successes on the same side with, with media, you know, we got a lot of great press um, and we all have, you know, mailing lists, email lists in the thousands. We combined them or in the tens of thousands. So that was awesome. Um, we expanded some of our reach. The Watershed Alliance got some more exposure in the lower Hudson. The Bronx River Alliance, you know, got, you know, a good foothold in Westchester. And for us, it wasn't a geographic thing, but we, um, you know, because we're a non-advocacy organization, it was nice just to do some action-oriented stuff with the Association of Riverkeeper. Um, again, a lot of it, in addition to that, our volunteers got a bigger community to work with. These are some photos from our end of year, you know, volunteer party. So instead of just working with 12 volunteers, combine them all together, and now we have 40, this team of 40 to 50 volunteers that all work together. Um, and there's new partnerships and some exciting stuff coming down the, the line here in Westchester County, especially. Uh, it's this, you know, working together, we got a lot of recognition and people are starting to notice. That was really huge for us. It was really great. Um, and I believe that is my last slide, yeah. But I could uh, pass it over to Jen. Thanks, Ryan. By way of introduction, Riverkeeper is, as Ryan mentioned, a nonprofit organization. We're focused on restoration and protection of the Hudson River. Um, I'm actually our water quality program scientist, not our outreach coordinator. We have a different Jen that does that job. <laughs> um, so, these three components of our vision that I've outlined in the slide all require healthy tributaries. Healthy rivers require healthy tributaries. So the work that we do on tributaries is just as important as the work that we do on the main stem of the Hudson River. And Riverkeeper is a part of the Water Keeper Alliance. So I want to say hello to any keepers or keeper staff that are out there on the webinar today. In this picture, you see our patrol boat. Um, which, as, as Ryan mentioned, routinely patrols the Hudson from New York City to the Capital District from about April to November, depending on uh, weather, really, how soon this, uh, how soon John Lipscomb, our captain, can get out there and, and how long he can stay out there. Um, the patrol boat acts as a deterrent. It, John seeks out enforcement cases. He brings people on board to see the world from the river, and the boat assists with research as well. And in the back there, you can see Carol Knudsen, who uh, works with John on our water quality testing program. The Hudson Valley is a water rich area. So if you live in the Hudson Valley and you like to be outdoors, chances are you're in or on the water. You're probably swimming and paddling. So when John began to patrol the Hudson in 2000, he saw a lot of people doing these activities all over the place. And they often asked him, how's the water? Um, as you all know, water quality is complicated. There's a lot of different aspects to it. Exposure to different pollutants is also complex. But for a human being who's swimming, fecal contamination is considered to be the most immediate um, and widespread concern. Um, harmful algal blooms are increasing in frequency in New York State, and more and more we're thinking about how to watch out for those and how to monitor those, but they are usually fairly obvious, whereas fecal contamination might not be. So in 2006, Riverkeeper began testing the Hudson for fecal contamination. 
to do that, we follow EPA's 2012 recreational water quality criteria to the maximum extent that we practically can. Um, the Hudson's an estuary and EPA recommends Enterococcus as the indicator for saline and fresh water. So that's what we use, Enterococcus. Um, it's a type of bacteria that's present in warm blooded animals. It's not usually harmful itself, but it does indicate the presence of fecal contamination and therefore the potential presence of pathogens. Uh, New York State has not yet acted on the EPA 2012 guidance uh, in its state standards. So one of our challenges has been the mismatch between the somewhat outdated New York State standards that are applied in official work um, and our methods, which are federally recommended but not um, state implemented. Uh, another challenge is that with respect to tributary work, we've had some questions about using Entero, um, although EPA equally recommends either Entero or E. coli in fresh water. Water testing practitioners seem to regard E. coli as the, the norm for freshwater testing. Um, so they've wondered why we apply, why we use Entero in fresh waters. Um, and it's because the, the Hudson has that wide range of salinities all the way from saline to fresh. And we see it as a, we see great value in a data set that can be uh, compared across the entire range of the watershed. The EPA's recreational water quality criteria are extremely detailed and are multifaceted. And I'm only going to dip a toe in them here today to explain how we present our results. Um, we present results in two ways, one focusing on the long term and one more focused on the short term. So first we calculate the geometric mean, which is simply a weighted average of all results over a certain period of time. EPA recommends a geometric mean of no greater than 30 cells per 100 milliliters of sample water. Um, and so although our sampling interval and frequency differ from EPA's recommendations, we assume that over the long term, the averages will be comparable. Uh, the geometric mean is good for showing the general status of the water over a fairly long time period and a broad space, but the problem is that people don't swim in average water. They swim at a particular place and time. So we also look at the results from each and every single sample that we take. We compare each sample result to the EPA's beach advisory value, which is another part of the criteria and is 60 entero per 100 milliliters of water. So if you sample a beach and the sample result is greater than 60, EPA recommends that you advise swimmers not to get in the water. And the single sample result is what we display on our website and what we communicate to samplers after each sampling event. And um, I found that it's a, it's a good way to report the data um, because people identify closely with their particular sample. They remember what they saw, what they smelled at that point, at that time, and many of our samplers check in on each and every result. Um, you know, they'll go to our website day after day and, and they'll let us know if we're not getting that data up there in time. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to communicate. People really identify with a single sample. We tend to match samplers with, with the sites for the long term. So one person will sample at a given place over the entire season or maybe even over multiple years. And that's another thing I think um, is a strength as relates to the, the data. People come to know their sampling spot. They, they might learn more about natural variations in the stream environment. Um, a lot of them I know find joy in visiting that spot and seeing what's going on in the river or the stream. Another strength in that is that we've got eyes on the ground. So samplers notice and investigate situations that, um, that might be problematic, like excessive algal growth or strange pipes sticking out of the bank flowing or not flowing, um, tree clearing activities, stuff like that. Over the longer term, we present the BAB as percentages of samples failing the threshold over time. And you'll see that in a few slides. So the EPA criteria are complicated. Um, that's fine. Water quality is complicated. That the criteria need to be applied widely. Um, it does present a challenge for us in communicating about our results because there are multiple ways of looking at the data. They're all important. Um, and although we've seen that they tend to reveal similar patterns, no single one really tells the whole story. 
Okay, so we can see why we care about fecal contamination. You can see how we measure it. Um, how did we create a community-based monitoring program? How do we do it? What are the results from these, these watersheds we're talking about today? How we started it is that Riverkeeper started testing a bit of the Hudson for Entrococcus in 2006. Um, we expanded to cover the full estuary, which is New York City to Albany, and you can see in the map on the right the, the coverage there of our sampling spots. We expanded to that range in 08, which we did by installing lab equipment on our patrol boat. There are two PIs for the Estuary Monitoring Project, Greg O'Mullen at CUNY Queens and Andy Jewell at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And they were the designers of this long-term monitoring study. And they, they um, identified these 74 sites with four types of sites. There are mid-channel sites, nearshore sites, tidal tributary sites, and wastewater treatment plant outfalls. So the nearshore mid-channel are what they sound like. They're two different main stem Hudson River environments. Um, the tidal tributary sites are in the mouths of tributaries to the Hudson. So these are waters that are mixtures of Hudson River water and tributary water, less or more depending on the tide. And the wastewater treatment plant outfalls are places where we sample directly at treatment plant discharge points. We sample once per month from May to October, and this is our 11th year testing at these 74 locations in the tidal portion of the Hudson. So Greg and Andy continue to be closely involved in the estuary monitoring, and we consult with them on the tributary monitoring as well. Um, the citizen science monitoring, I should say, our community science work. So some of the, the basic results from our estuary monitoring are here. They, one of the, the main core findings is that um, contamination is greater in tributaries. So you can see in these donut figures, the percentage of samples that exceeded the BAV, the beach advisory value, that's in red, and the remaining percentage in green for these two sets of sites. At near shore sites and mid-channel sites, 18% of the samples taken indicated that the water was not suitable for swimming. In the tidal tributary sites, 36% of samples indicated the water unsuitable for swimming. And my handouts include our most recent water quality report, which goes into more detail about um, this, these results and results from some of the community science work. But the upshot of this is that people heard the story and very soon they began to ask questions and develop hypoth hypotheses about the sources of this tributary contamination. So John Lipscomb started to provide people with bottles. They went upstream further than his boat was able to go, sampled from banks, and he began to coordinate drop-offs at the boat. And from there, um, the network has really grown. Uh, the blue dots on the map are now overlaid from the estuary monitoring, and you can see that we've managed to reach all the way up to the source of the Hudson, all the way out to Rome, New York, and uh, the Mohawk, the Hudson's largest tributary, and throughout the Hudson Valley. Uh, it's scores of community scientists, dozens of organizations. We're all affiliated with one another in, to varying degrees in various ways, and together we're building a really huge data set about this watershed while also simultaneously drilling down locally in a few hundred places. So in the Lower Hudson Partnership, I'm going to talk about how our community science program works. We have an approved co-op from EPA. Uh, prior to that grant and since that grant, we followed the same model, but the co-op technically applies only during the grant period. And a, co a copy of the co-op is in Ryan's handouts. So we have set sampling locations on each of the streams and everyone goes out simultaneously to collect water from their designated sampling sites. We train people on the sampling protocol, which is a simple grab sample, and we supply people with sterile sampling bottles. So the individual volunteers provide their own transportation, which can be considerable, uh, and usually they, they'll supply their gloves and ice, although we typically tell people to just get in touch with us if they need us to supply that for them. Everyone returns their samples to the lab at CURB by a set deadline in the day. And like Ryan said, CURB has a lab tech who does all the processing and a lot of data entry. So what do the data show? <clears throat> in this figure, the red bars are the percentage of samples taken in each of these watersheds that have exceeded the beach advisory value, um, indicating that, that people should be advised not to swim in the water. Um, so conditions at each individual site in the watershed may be better or worse, but overall, in these four watersheds, the samples fail the BAV the vast majority of the time. The norm is for the water to be not swimmable. 
And of course, the project durations, the number of sites, the number of samples do vary. This is just kind of a rough comparison. In this figure, we're looking at the geometric mean for the same set of samples that we were looking at in the previous slide. And the vertical red line shows EPA's recommended threshold for average water quality of 30 cells per 100 milliliters of water. So again, as with the BAV, all of these watersheds are well over the threshold by about an order of magnitude. Spark Hill Creek is over by about a uh, factor of 20. And the pattern is similar, but the geomean does give us a different kind of information. It shows the severity of the failures more clearly. Um, it shows, actually shows the severity of the failures, period. Um, and it, it better teases out the differences between the watersheds. So our handouts include data summaries from the sawmill, which is in Ryan's packet, and the Bronx River, which is in Michelle's packet. And I failed to include summaries from the other two streams in the partnership, but if anybody wants, I'd be happy to send those out. Just get in touch with me. So back to how the, the science, the community science works, is the, the important piece of doing things with the data. Um, we try to do a lot. The results go out to the Riverkeeper and the Bronx River Alliance websites. They go out by email. We do presentations where we summarize the study. We provide analysis. We provide local specifics. We provide regional context. We analyze wet weather responses. I didn't show it here, but we do uh, record whether samples were taken after rain. We produce reports and we give them to samplers to bring in the field and spread the word and we send them around to municipalities and agencies. Um, we use the data for advocacy like in comment letters on New York State DEC permit approvals. Uh, we use the data in lobbying such as the lobbying that Riverkeeper did through the last budget cycle for infrastructure funding for wastewater um, and also for DEC staff funding. Um, while we can't predict conditions at any given time or place, the information helps people decide how much contact to have with the water. Should I swim here? Should I swim there? Should I paddle? Should I swim? What about my dog? Can my dog swim? I get that question a lot. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no answer for that one. Um, and I've been contacted a handful of times by people who are thinking about buying property in um, on the water. Um, with the hope of owning a place where they can swim out from their yard, from a dock in their yard, and they want to know about these data. So there's there's certainly a, a demand for it and a, 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 um, a serious one. Riverkeeper's website compiles data from all over the Hudson Valley, and the Bronx River website has a beautiful interface that takes a more in-depth look at sites in that watershed. I'm going to move on to our community scientist survey results. Um, although we haven't dwelled on specific results today, the couple of slides I showed you do make a clear case that water quality in these watersheds needs attention. Um, and at Riverkeeper, as we've seen the community science work we do around this issue take off just in an astonishing way, we've contemplated a lot how to use the data and the people power to, to change water quality for the better. So. To that end, last fall, we conducted a survey of community water quality volunteers um, to explore their motivations and their limitations, uh, what they thought about our successes and failures and, and so forth. Um, Riverkeeper created the survey. We sent it out. We crunched the data. We did the analysis. But the audience included these four tributaries and also many others. Um, as I mentioned at the at, in an earlier slide, the programs within this network vary in format, so attitudes vary from place to place, and this is a really broad overview. Um, and I do want to thank credit, uh, give credit to Lincoln Larson and Karen Cooper um, at NC State for their help with the survey and the survey reports in, in my packet. So what did we find? We found that participants um, feel confident in themselves and the program, and they are highly likely to continue participating, so we feel we have a strong foundation. We also found that they um, want more data and they want to use the data better. So these are equally positive to us and, and look like potential ways to grow. Um, another thing that we did in the survey was we tried to identify barriers to further participation. From talking to people, we think they want to do more and see more happen. So we wanted to know what keeps people from doing more. And the idea was to help plan how to how to proceed. So we asked people to rate the seriousness of 13 possible barriers to participation. 
Um, the five on the left that you see in light green are considered individual barriers, things that we as program managers can't really change, but we can design around or respond to, like people's interest level or confidence level. The eight bars on the right are in dark green are the project barriers. These are things that we do have more control over, like understanding of data, connection with participants, recognition, things like that. So as you can see from this figure, most of the barriers rated somewhere from non-existent to minor. Um, and one really stood out from all the rest, and that's I don't have enough free time. So that's a major challenge we're dealing with. And we've all invested tremendous time and energy into collecting and compiling this information. Um, that's of great value. And yet to many of us, it feels like just the beginning. Um, however, unlike samplers, I get paid to do that. Ryan and Michelle get paid to do that. And um, so, you know, people are feeling like they don't have time to do more. Uh, so as the project designers and the program managers, I think we're in a position where we understand the data quite, quite comprehensively. We understand its content and limitations. Um, and we've got a, a knowledge of the attitudes and postures of different agencies and municipalities that maybe samplers don't have. So I think that um, my interpretation of this is that we need to be strategic and identify really good opportunities beyond sampling for community scientists to be heard by decision makers and the rest of their communities. They, for their part, have a very detailed knowledge of their local places and deeply felt connections to the water. Um, so I think we need to identify moments where we can convey a clear message based on the data, but also ask people to, to share their, their individual passions and their interests. So we did the survey in the fall, we reported on it in the winter, and now we're really figuring out how to put the learning from it into practice. Um, we've had success um, with prescription drug take back, where we kind of put some of our learning into action, but it's a, it's a work in progress. And one challenge is certainly that opportunities don't necessarily present themselves for all the problems that exist, and it can be hard to, to find ways to be proactive, especially if municipalities have other priorities. Another um, thing that we that we see is that it's important to plan for this follow-up work specifically to put staff time into our budgets. We underestimated this in the in the LHP grant. Um, and finally, we can't ignore the time that people already give to the foundational data gathering part of the program. So people contribute in the ways that suit them best, and it's absolutely critical to recognize people's contributions and think about whether there's an opportunity. Uh, to call on people who can't or maybe don't want to collect samples to take some of these next steps. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to talk more about the data-driven advocacy piece of our program. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, so yeah, so our position in, <clears throat> in this particular partnership also lends itself very well to grassroots action, but then also um, the advocacy component. Um, so just a little background on the Bronx River Alliance. We have five different program areas, um, ecology and restoration, education, recreation, greenway, and outreach. So we take about 2,000 kids out every year. We take about 1,500 paddlers out. Um, and we have planted well over 100,000 trees within the Bronx portion of the Bronx River watershed. And although we were founded in 2001, um, it really was two grassroots movements that, that really formed our organization. So in the 1970s, um, they created the uh, a Bronx River Working Group, and they were um, a lot of just community advocates that were removing things like cars and refrigerators from the river. Um, and then in the 90s, it was really reinvigorated. And then that groundswell really create, took um, through a catalyst program with the New York City Park System, we created a public-private partnership. Um, and a lot of people who come out and work with us uh, are lifelong Bronx residents, and they didn't even know that there was a river in their backyard. Um, and so in uh, so our, our expansion into the full watershed was not as, was, was a much more recent um, occurrence. That was something that I was kind of tasked with when I came on in 2015, 
was to really look at a holistic watershed perspective and see where we could grow our program. Um, so our water quality program, as with many of our other programs, originally was just within the Bronx. So there are two sites that that red dot up at the top of the, of the map. Um, so there were really um, six sample sites within the within the Bronx portion, and that had been funded by the EPA to run a citizen science water quality monitoring program. Um, and the reason why it was considered was because it, although it was by no means being done by citizens, it was be, being done by staff. Um, so what you see here are are two of our staff members doing um, water quality monitoring. And so that ran from 2014 to 2016, like that with staff really running it. Um, with staff, but in that process is when we were introduced to Ryan at Curb um, and Jen and Dan over at Riverkeeper. And we realized a lot of the recruitment that we were seeking to do with Westchester constituencies and then also to monitor the full watershed would really be um, made easier if we partnered with groups that were already doing similar work. Um, so what we did in 2016 was we repeated previous uh, sites that, the, that Westchester County had previously surveyed. Um, and like Ryan had talked about, in order to do that, we had to get a, a permit from them. But because they assumed that all nonprofits are litigious, um, they were afraid that the only reason we were coming in was not from nerdy scientific understanding. It was really to 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 kind of like a gotcha moment. Um, and so that was not what we necessarily wanted to portray. And we spent a long time trying to let them know that that's not our intention. Um, and we were finally granted the the um, permit and so then in beginning in 2017 was our first all year full river um, all volunteer led full watershed sampling and so one of the things that we were found that we were super successful with is that there was a, a stormwater outfall you see pictured here um, and that is toilet paper and sewage so this was taken in 2015 although we had known about it beginning in 2014 and we had been working with the municipality to, to try to get them to go out there and, and do something about it. Um, but the city of Yonkers does not have a lot of money. Um, and so they were, it, it was not moving very quickly. Um, here's a little bit of the data that you can see. Um, don't worry about the, the graph. I just want to sort of show you that the 25,000 on the top left of your screen that that the dots are getting up to in 2014 and 2015. That's pretty much the max of the scale that we used for intro. So you can see it was it was all over the map. It was putting raw sewage in. Um, and what we discovered was that there was a diner and an apartment building that had a clog in the sanitary line. And so it was basically directing all of the sanitary sewer straight into the Bronx River through that pipe. So sometime between 2015 and 2016 is when the city of Yonkers was able to go out and fix it, although they did not make this a very public fix to us. It, we just discovered it in 2016 and said, oh, the levels are back down. Um, but then in 2017, and you can see again in 2018, um, there have been moments when it has gone back up and we've called them and said, hey, you have a problem. And they said, are you referring to this particular outfall? And we said, yes. And they said, yes, we know about it. Um, and they are under consent order for this. But again, we are not looking at it from a litigious standpoint. We are really looking at it as a how to best utilize finite resources and make the best possible uh, changes along the river. So how do we essentially triage the river? So although we have improved from 2015, that one spike that you saw in 2018, we had bubbles coming out of the outfall um, and it smelled like detergent. So obviously there's still some more work that we need to do, 
but um, the fact that there's not toilet paper and raw sewage going in, we consider a success. Um, similarly, Curb had a, a, a success also with the city of Yonkers. Similar sort of situation. They had gone out to a pipe. Um, there was uh, algae blooms at the downstream end of their outfall pipe, and they lobbied the well, not lobbied, but they they went to the city of Yonkers and said, "What's going on?" Yonkers uh, put a TV line into the pipes. They found the issue. Uh, and they disconnected the four-story mixed-use building that had been putting their sanitary sewer pipes uh, directly into the stormwater. So those are some of the things that we really like to talk about when we're talking to the volunteers about the, the benefits of them participating in this program, is that it really allows us to collect things like this. So we've been allowed to see um, uh, the e we've been able to uh, really communicate in a number of different ways. We send e-blasts out every every time we sample with the data, so that everyone knows what has been found. Um, we do a lot of the community-based outreach. We've been able to reach out to our different municipalities and say, "Hey, we we think there's a problem at this particular pipe," and then that is a is appreciated to them because they are under um, what's known as an MS4 permit. So for those who are not familiar with the acronym, it's Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So theoretically, you should not be having any sewage out of an MS4 pipe, um, and yet we are. So um, so we're looking at how can we, um, how can we really see, um, how can we best use the scarce resources that the municipalities have without having to trigger the need for an MS4 permit enforcement by the state? Um, and that also helps us make more friends in municipalities. If we're constantly slapping them with fines, um, then they're probably going to be less uh, amenable to hearing, yes, we could go work together. So what we've really been doing is trying to proffer this, the carrot as opposed to the stick. Um, and then that also has allowed us to work more closely with different local and state agencies to really sort of move this forward. Um, one of the things that we've been able to communicate also is that um, the city, in our case, New York City, um, is responsible for the combined sewage overflows. And you can see on the map on the left, the dotted line is, is demarcating our MS4 section from our CSO section. So a lot of people, especially in New York City area, think that poor water quality is attributable to the CSOs, but we're actually seeing more consistently better water quality in the estuary section than we are in the tributary section much like what Jen's data that she presented earlier um, had, had found. Um, and you can see on our June and our September dates on this particular map with the water droplet, those were our rainy dates. And so those were the dates that we were seeing some of the worst water quality, um, except for the one stray pipe down, uh, that's 4,352. That's again, that pipe that you saw with the, the, the same pipe that we've been managing. That was the spike in the, at the end of 2017. Um, and so what we've been able to do is by visualizing data in different ways, we are hoping to reach different types of audiences. And then also elected officials, and we can go to them, and we can present them with something, a map like this, and it, and it makes a little bit of the scariness of science um, and the scariness of math. It takes it out of it, and it makes it a lot more visually appealing. <clears throat> And then, oops, there we go. And then the the other main thing that we've really been doing as well is that we've been using the data to help follow up with these consent orders and to encourage participation by the larger community at citywide hearings, like this New York City Council hearing of the Environmental Committee, um, which you see in this picture here. So this this particular hearing was in reference to what are known as the long-term control plans that the city is putting forth. And these are intended to be water body specific measures to help ameliorate the CSO contamination of, of the different water bodies. 
Um, but a lot of the different regional and local advocacy groups in the city said that it doesn't, they don't go far enough. They are huge investments for the Bronx River is $150 million to build gray infrastructure, um, but we'll still have over about 300 million gallons of combined sewage overflows per year. And that's at minimum. That's not taking into account climate change and um, increased rainy events. And that's not taking into consideration any new development structures that are going to put additional water and CSOs into the river. And so what we've been able to do is really leverage a lot of um, our position in the community, but then also um, our position within these larger regional contexts. So we're part of the SWIM Coalition, which is Stormwater Infrastructure Matters. It's really just a cute acronym to basically say that we are advocates for fishable swimmable waters, and which is mandated by the Clean Water Act by 1986. And I don't know if anyone's looked at a calendar lately, but we missed it. So what we're really trying to do is, is bring this to the forefront and say, this is an issue that we need to address. Um, and it needs to be addressed much more holistically than it has been. And throwing money at more infrastructure and not looking at it in a holistic way is really not going to get where we need to be. So working with groups like the Swim Coalition and NRDC and Riverkeeper and other watershed groups like ours, we were able to have a big turnout at the, at the hearing, including inviting a number of school children, which really made the city council members um, very interested in uh, what we had to say. And it was a good moment for them and all of us to share our observations and experiences and be able to use data driven, use the data to do data driven advocacy, which is really much more powerful than just saying, well, I think I, I want to work in the, I want to swim in the river, um, but it's dirty. But if we can back up our thoughts with, we know exactly the levels of enterococcus. We know exactly when we're seeing these spikes and, uh, and really address it that way, then, then it's a lot more powerful of an advocacy tool. The other thing that is a very powerful advocacy tool is that when we give the public these moments, we create action items um, that they can show up at these hearings or they can send in a letter or they can sign on to a comment letter or they can call their elected officials and say, I am a volunteer on the river and my site has shown bad water quality and we would like your help to help make this a larger issue so that people are really paying attention to what it is that we are trying to say. Um, one issue that we have had because of our public-private partnership with New York City Parks is trying to carefully navigate through this this situation because part of us are affiliated with the city. We can't come wholesale out against the city. And so that's really why we have um, been advocating for our constituents to participate, for our members, for our local community members. Um, and then we also use our, our board of directors. And then we also have some teams within the Bronx River Alliance. We have a Greenway team and an ecology team. And we really use our team members to come out and write strong letters against things like this when we don't feel that we as a staff um, should be, should be um, engaging in that. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Maureen. Maureen, you may be muted if you're speaking. Hi, everyone. This is Maureen Cunningham with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Uh, what you see in the map in the middle is how water people see the world. And, and there's some of my water people on the right um, in the other picture. Um, 
What you see on the map, it's one of my favorite slides, is where the water flows. Um, so it shows the boundaries of our country's watersheds. Um, what you don't see on the map our state boundaries, county boundaries, town boundaries, and in New York State, village boundaries. So this, in a nutshell, I think, is why water protection is so hard. Um, in addition, in the Hudson River, we have many current and legacy threats faced by our water quality. Um, because the Hudson River has been such a symbol of economic and industrial activity for so many centuries, and this has had a cost. But this cross-boundary aspect of watersheds also underscores why it's so important to take a multi-organizational and multi-governmental approach. Uh, as some context to the Hudson River watershed, which is in turquoise on that map, you can't see it that well, the watershed includes over 65 major tributaries, including the Mohawk River, it drains 13,000 square miles from the Adirondack Mountains to the New York Harbor. The watershed actually, the area of the watershed represents a third of the total area of New York State. Uh, and parts of the watershed are in five states. So we're definitely cross boundaries in this watershed. My organization, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, is an alliance of alliances. So we're a network of 30, sometimes more, sometimes less, grassroots community and or intermunicipal groups up and down the Hudson River, including the four that have been mentioned today, the Bronx River, Pecanico River, Sawmill River, and Spark Hill River Watershed Alliances. Our mission is to empire, empower, unite, and support people and communities to protect and manage these Hudson River water resources. Um, in New York State, we have home rule, which essentially means that much of our water management and protection takes place at the local municipal level. I think um, Michelle highlighted some of the, the work that our groups are doing at the municipal level, which just is another reason why our community watershed groups and this kind of collaboration across watersheds, uh, across organizations and municipalities is so critical. Projects like the one that you've been listening to involving uh, citizen science often serve as a gateway to wider watershed protection and organizing efforts. Uh, many of our watershed groups actually began with the citizen science efforts, uh, including the Spark Hill group, which began with monitoring in Terracaucus with Riverkeeper. Um, we have I think we're really lucky here in the Hudson Valley. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of active citizen scientists. Um, and in addition to monitoring in Terracaucus, uh, which was described by Jen, our groups are also monitoring other water quality indicators, so macroinvertebrates through a state program called WAVE, and populations of the American eel through the Hudson River Eel Project. The last thing I wanted to mention on this slide was just, I think, uh, the importance and power of celebrating successes, which I don't actually think we're always good at in this field uh, and in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I think the reason why this project has been so successful is not only the partnerships that we formed, but also the ability to look back and celebrate the successes of the partners. Nice. It's not letting me advance. Uh, there we go. The summit that took place in March brought all of the partners and uh, stakeholders together. We had stakeholders from land trusts to municipal governments to state and federal officials together in one room. Uh, it was also the first time we ever featured a panel of all of our watershed groups who as everyone has described, are really the boots on the ground of water protection here. So it served as an introduction to many of the stakeholders in the room of the work that they're doing. The Pecanico River Watershed Alliance was formed in 2016, so this was actually the first time that they ever gave a region-wide presentation as an independent organization. So the summit was a great way to celebrate the success of all the groups and also to shine a spotlight on the importance of these grassroots efforts in protecting our regional supplies. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back to Ryan to wrap everything up. Thank you, Maureen, and everybody. Um, and Maureen, if you could just click to the next slide, I think you're still in control there. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep 
closing thoughts brief. I know we're running out of time here, and um, there's one more slide from River Network I wanted to share some things with you. So please stay on the line, um, and I think we can go over and answer some questions if you have any. Um, so please type those in. Uh, but yeah, in closing thoughts, I mean, as you've seen throughout the webinar, uh, we've had plenty of successes. Um, you know, it is going to be hard to fix these problems pipe by pipe, I and mean, those are great success stories, but obviously that's just just the, the tip of the iceberg there in terms of working that way. And as Maureen pointed out, we have these challenges in New York State of, you know, the, the municipality's not really working together all that often because um, of this home rule, uh, um, you know, legacy, if you will. Um, so we have a lot of challenges. Um, I did definitely want to um, just give gratitude and thanks to EPA for their funding. Um, I also wanted to point out, you know, we all, all of our groups get funded through the state, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, one way or the other, uh, mostly through the Hudson River Estuary Program. Um, so we do have good federal and state partners. Um, and also, New York State, there has been some some really historical investment in you know, upgrading infrastructure lately, too, uh, just happening last year. So there's a lot of good things happening. Uh, again, we have lots of work to do. You know, at the scale we're working on the watershed scale, I will say we need more county uh, leadership in New York. You know, there's a lot of things delegated at the county level. And depending on sort of local politics and what's going on and funding, um, you know, a lot of times the counties do fall a little short. Uh, there is there's huge um, you know, discrepancy between one county to the next. So it makes it very hard to work regionally, and that's for sure. But, I mean, these two photos are from the summit. We have folks that are on the panel from the state. Um, from um, Westchester County, Rockland County. Um, so we have these folks at the table, um, but we do we do need more there. So work in progress. We're going to keep at it, and, and hopefully, um, you know, we've held back from us in a few years. We'll do another webinar <laughs> with, with bigger successes. Um, with that, I believe there's a, um, a slide coming up from the River Network, and then we'll have some time for questions if we have any. Great. Thank you, Ryan. There sure is. So, yes, please go ahead and put any questions you have. Uh, in the questions box and we do have um, Adam Griggs here our science manager from River Network to to finish up today for us what pardon me Ryan or Adam there you go yeah thanks uh, so just a quick plug for some of our science resources if you're looking for uh, new resources technologies and best practices uh, to help your monitoring programs be as successful as some of the ones you just got to take a look at uh, we are doing some work as part of uh, a member of a new uh, partnership called the Water Data Collaborative, where we're taking a broad scale look, a holistic look at the resources and technology that are supporting community watershed science across the country and those networks and hubs that also support that work on the ground. And we're looking at trying to better organize those resources, highlight some of the best case studies, and, and look for gaps and barriers that we may be able to plug with new technologies to really kind of uh, overall meet our goals of, of more quality, more quantity, and, and more accessibility of, of community watershed science data in the coming future. So uh, a lot of the resources that you see uh, in this framework that moves from basically study design to data to action elements, uh, this framework is, is replicated on our website. And we are actively working to uh, plug resources into those. So you can search for those on our website uh, by looking for the Science Resource Portal. And thanks. Great. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm going to flip through our last slide here just to um, remind you that the Urban Waters Learning Network website has great resources, impact stories, uh, member profiles about all of these projects. So I encourage you to check that out. We do have four. Uh, Urban Waters Learning Network webinars scheduled uh, between August and September. So if you go to the Urban Waters Learning Network website or River Network, you can register for these um, upcoming webinars. Uh, and the link to today's recording will also be sent out by email, so be on the lookout for that. I'm going to go ahead and flip to our last slide and thank our presenters. Um, in case we do lose anybody, uh, we will stay on the line. We do have some questions coming in, but I do want to thank um, all of our panelists today for their time and the information they've shared. And I'm going to turn it over to Renee because I know, um, as I said, we do have some questions coming in. So if you're leaving us, thanks for joining us this afternoon. And we'll stay on the line for a few minutes and try to get through as many questions as we have for our panelists. Go ahead, Renee. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks to the presenters as well. Um, the first question here, do you encourage volunteers and nonprofit organizational staff to share information via Water Reporter app. And there's a link to the, the waterreporter.org, which consolidates an annual spreadsheet for organizational members. So 
So I'm not sure if you'd like to field that question, but yeah. go ahead. <laughs> this is Jen. Yeah, this is um, Go ahead, Ryan. No, I don't, I, I, I'm not familiar with that app, but I'll definitely look into it. I don't know if you if you use that. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. Thanks for the, 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 the link, though. Sure. Uh, this is Adam. Uh, water Reporter is a product of um, Chesapeake Commons, who's actually one of our partners in the Water Data Collaborative. And they are uh, rolling out kind of a suite of services that, if we look at that framework, will kind of help groups from basically steps two to six. So helping them manage their data and, and do some of the data visualizations, have live data dashboards where uh, public can come to their website and, and explore that data live. Um, so they're one of the organizations that's plugging in resources um, into those needs. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, Jen Epstein identified one of the major barriers to creating effective citizen science program is not having enough time. Um, there are many citizen science programs that have had success integrating citizen science with employment or job training programs, um, which also allows groups to reach a wider range of participants. Have you explored employment options rather than relying exclusively on volunteers? We have not. Maybe Michelle can speak to that, though. Yeah, I was. I was just gonna say, ooh, this is. This sounds like a good question for me. Um, so yes, we do not particularly with this. Uh, with this research study, so we do have um, job employment programs. Our we have a full time conservation crew that, and in the summertime, we have um, five four or five uh, green job trainees, and they do learn water quality along with invasive species removal, native planting, um, green infrastructure maintenance, and, um, a lot of the sort of in the field um, green job skills. Um, we also work with them on some of our other research projects, including fish, um, both alewives and American eels, and then also our project waste, which is our trash assessment and abatement program. Um, but this one, we do uh, we do rely on volunteers. Um, that's not to say that we couldn't use green job trainees for this, but because we're really just sending people out, taking a water sample, and they're not as involved in sort of the the lab um, the lab work or or things mm -hmm. like that, we we've um, really tried to market it to a different type of volunteer. Okay. And we are just saying that we are working on that on our end. This is Ryan um, on the lab side. I'm actually writing a grant proposal right now <laughs> to try to fund this idea of a, of a blue team. I know we've all heard there's lots of green teams out there, but I, I want to create this blue team of uh, high school students who would be trained, uh, you know, in the spring as, as part of their coursework. They'd come here for uh, like an academy kind of thing. Um, and then throughout the throughout the summer and the sampling season, they'd actually be out there uh, paid volunteers getting samples and um, working in the lab. So we're working on it, work in progress. Um, check back any year, hopefully. <laughs> Love the money. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, there's another one about the volunteer. Um, what is the time commitment expected of your volunteer water monitors? And have you found that there's a, a threshold of how many hours or how often people can typically monitor? Um, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> it, it depends. Um, some it takes them a half hour, some it takes them an hour, some it takes them multiple hours, um, depending on how close their sample site is to their home um, and whether they are collecting the sample and then transporting it to the lab or if they are collecting the sample and dropping it off to somebody who is then shuttling it to the lab. Yeah, I'll just say to the to speak to the second part of that question, this is Jen Epstein. In my experience, um, there's a wide range. Some people come in and they're just like, oh God, no, I, I gotta run, I gotta run. And then some people are just so excited to spend the better part of a Saturday every month doing this. So it certainly depends. Mm -hmm. Great. There's just one more question, and this one looks like it's for Michelle. The Michelle's graph showing monitoring data along the river is fantastic. How was that graphic made? Oh, the one with the stop sign? 
um, that my brilliant friend Corinne made. Um, she's one of the most gifted vi uh, data visualizers I've ever met. And when I saw that, I said, is there a better way that you could um, help me portray the data? And she came up with that. And it was just, I love that graph. That is on one of my handouts. So if you guys are interested, it's in there. Um, and yes, she's brilliant. And I will pass along your kudos to her. As far as the program she used, that was probably ArcGIS, and uh, you yeah, can it was. when she gets, yeah, just look at that river there. You can uh, say to plot the the data point by the size of the value, so it would automatically adjust the size of that stop sign based on how the the data value there. Great. Well, thanks. Great. Well, I do see a, a hand raised. Monty, are you still on the line with us? And did you have a question you were wanting to type in for our panelists before we before we end today? I'll give him a second um, if if he does indeed have a question. Um, and while we're waiting to see, uh, great, there is one more question coming out. I will remind you before you log out to download the handouts that today's panelists provided. Um, uh, and we will also try to send out an email with links to those um, handouts as well. So, okay, Monty says no question, but we did have one more come in. So go ahead, Renee, and I'll let you finish up. Okay, so it's, have you documented the relationship with schools in the Hudson River watershed, K-12, as well as higher ed? Can you repeat that, the relationship with K-12? Can you repeat that? It says, have you documented the relationship with schools in the Hudson River watershed? Anyone want to talk? I'm not sure I understand. So she yeah. says, such as, how do schools help with monitoring? I can. Jen, do you want to speak? This is Maureen. I can just say um, we do have an event called uh, A Day in the Life of the Hudson, and it's uh, DEC, uh, our state organization that kind of oversees it. But a lot of the watershed groups actually run A Day Life in the Life of the Hudson events with schools. Um, and Hudson River Sloop Clearwater is another organization in the Hudson, and they do a lot of work with, with school children as well. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, so we, this is Jen from Riverkeeper. We've not had great luck getting um, K-12 and even college students involved because the the sampling uh, the sampling goes from May to October, which sort of is straddled between two semesters and a summer. So it hasn't really worked to get students involved. I, kids though, going out with their parents have that's been um, a really meaningful thing that families have done and we've also um, have not we've developed a, a small data data set um, and I have have thought about the idea of uh, developing like an educational data set so using some of the data to illustrate certain environmental um, science lessons but that's not something we've really done in earnest so far Great. Well, with that, folks, I don't see any more questions coming in, and we are definitely over time. So, again, wanted to thank our panelists for all the great information they shared with us and everybody who stayed on the line through the questions. I hope you'll join us for our future Urban Waters Learning Network webinar, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.